Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. We have an extraordinary uh, panel, and uh, we, we look forward to a great conversation and uh, solving the problem of modern slavery in the next 45 minutes. So we want to get started and not lose any time. Um, let me uh, first uh, just introduce the, uh, the panel, who are some extraordinary figures here. Um, um, not extraordinary is me. I'm Nicholas Gustav from the New York Times. I've written a lot about the issue. Uh, to my immediate left, Kailash Satyarthi, who has just worked heroically on uh, the issue of uh, child labor, especially in India, and has not just battled this issue, but has made real progress uh, in ways that are truly inspiring. Um, Arnie Sorensen is the, runs the Marriott Corporation and has been a leader in the business world on uh, addressing this issue, particularly the sex trafficking end of things as it uh, relates to, uh, to the hotel business. Um, Sharon Burrow is the head of the ITUC, which has been a uh, leader in uh, addressing uh, forced labor around the world and uh, has just had a success that I want to uh, talk to, uh, talk about in just a moment. Uh, Bill Swing um, runs the IOM, which is working in every corner of the globe uh, and, uh, and helping uh, victims of trafficking, of forced labor of modern slavery uh, all over. And, and Bill has some uh, numbers and data, which we're going to go to in just a moment. But I also just want to note that this is kind of an extraordinary moment. I've been coming to Davos forever. And this is our second panel just today on this issue. And this really <laughs> does feel as if this issue is getting more traction and getting more attention. And what has enabled it to be so persistent, and as we'll see, to have 40 million people uh, suffering under uh, modern slavery, is that by and large it's been ignored. And it's been seen as hopeless. And I think that that is changing. And the fact that, indeed, we're having a second panel just today, just at Davos, underscores that degree to which uh, sunlight, the best disinfectant, is, is arising on this issue. One of the first times I, uh, I wrote about this issue was <coughs> in 1996 in Cambodia, in a town called Svai Pak, where there were um, very young girls who'd been trafficked, who were being openly auctioned off. And at that time, the only help that aid groups were providing was twice a week they were sending a doctor in to treat STDs of these very young girls. And that was seen as kind of the only thing that could be done. And uh, nobody really thought of maybe a better idea, which is to actually close those brothels and help those girls and, and stop the trade. And in fact, since then, uh, that has happened. And perfectly unsuccessfully, mm -hmm. uh, we still need a lot more work. But there has been this change. And it does seem to me that, um, you know, until if you look back at traditional slavery as a model, and until about 1780, de jure slavery was just accepted, and there were a few Quakers who were jumping up and down about it, but nobody else. And then when it got attention, and people began to understand what it was, then in a few years, uh, in Britain, a coalition of evangelicals, human rights activists, uh, set in motion what would eventually become uh, the end of slavery around the world. And it took time, and it's obviously incomplete, which is why we're having that panel today. But it feels to me that something similar is happening mm -hmm. in recent years with these modern forms of slavery. And now to give us a sense of what those numbers are, what the picture is like in 2018, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Bill Swing, and uh, shout out also to Randy Sargent, uh, who is back there, uh, who has helped put together this presentation that uh, we're about to see. Bill. Thank you. Hi, good morning. It's a great honor to be with you, and we're delighted at the show of interest in this important issue. I obviously come, I don't come from the digital era, so you're taking a great chance with me this morning. 
trying to do something I've never done before is, is speak to data on a map. Uh, these maps are based on human trafficking data from a recently launched a, a new uh, effort we're making called the Counter Trafficking Data Collaborative, CTDC. And each of the references you see here refers to the country in which the victims were exploited. Now the data set, let's be fair, it's, it's only 80,000. These are the 80,000 cases of victims of trafficking whom IOM has helped around the world in the 480 places, 170 countries in which we work. Uh, obviously 40 million, 80,000 is not a lot, but it gives us at least a good glimpse. These are actual people whom we've, we've gotten the data from, uh, obtained directly from them, but we've also been assisted by two NGOs. One is Polaris, which is a, the United States uh, National Human Trafficking Hotline that they run, and an Asian uh, group called like, Liberty Asia uh, that does, has its own data collection system to help NGOs inside uh, uh, Asia. Now, there are many forms of exploitation. We're only going to deal with two today. I've counted 10. I'll quickly go through them. Forced labor, debt bondage, uh, sexual exploitation, forced child labor, uh, forced begging, uh, trafficking for organ removal, forced marriage, forced domestic work, and exploitation in the fishing industry, which is r rampant, in, particularly in Southeast Asia. And then finally, uh, child soldiers, with whom we've had a lot to do also, including in Colombia right now. Uh, so we're, we're confining ourselves today to sexual exploitation and human trafficking for forced labor and to see how these trends have somewhat changed over the years. Our data, uh, we have data on the other forms, but we're only going to talk about these two. The trends are interesting because in the past, victims traffic were always associated with the sex trade. Uh, they were the main ones identified. But the proportion of victims trafficked for forced labor is now, and I know Sharon, you can confirm this better than I, has steadily risen to become the most significant category of victims assisted today. These are often young males going from Southeast Asia into other countries with a promise that they'll be fine and then their salary is taken away from them and they really become slaves. Um, past years you can see almost equal proportion of cases of forced labor and sexual exploitation. But the higher proportion of exploitation cases in the last two years uh, it reflects data contributed by Polaris from the U.S. where most of the victims continue in the U.S. to be female. So it's so somewhat of an exception. Now, over time, the percentage of male victims of trafficking has increased significantly. Earlier years, it was almost all confined to women and the sex trade. Acknowledgement now that men and boys are also vulnerable uh, to human trafficking has <coughs> led to a much higher percentage of males now identified. And in the U.S., again, you can see more red circles uh, also in the past years due to the higher number of females identified, and the majority of whom were trafficked for labor exploitation. Now, children and adults, most of the victims identified are adults, but there's a constant proportion of child victims from most of the countries and regions. And globally, at least a quarter of all those identified in trafficking have been children. Um, now, what the data does not tell us, that's, that's a very significant part, because this is a work in progress. I hope we can bring something like this back to Davos every year, because it will grow significantly. The information on the map is not meant to quantify the number of victims of human trafficking. It cannot tell us the real number of victims of human trafficking. We right now are doing number of lives lost at sea and in the Sahara. We don't know how many bodies are buried under the sands or in the bottom of the sea. We know how many we've counted, which was 5,000 last year. Same thing with this data. We don't know exactly. So uh, we're talking about estimates of human trafficking, and it's the data on identified victims and people who've been assisted. Um, now, what are the, impro the improvements in the visualization of human trafficking data? This is just an initial version of a map <coughs> with global primary data on victims of human trafficking to show some of the trends over time and country level. This will become much more valuable as we, as we perfect it and get more data. 
significant potential to improve our understanding of the profile of the victims and human trafficking flows by using this sort of, these types of data sets. Most of the human trafficking data at global level has not yet been put on a map. We hope that won't be too far off. Uh, let me see, Nicholas, if I have anything more. I think that I had just, a, maybe, let me just say uh, whether this ad data actually offers estimates in terms of victims of human trafficking globally. No, it does not. Um, so I think I'll just leave it with that to give you a general idea of a work in progress. I hope we'll have something more significant to show you next year. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks so much for that. And the numbers uh, you know, truly are uh, just, just staggering uh, on a global basis. Um, Kailash, you have worked uh, on this for, for decades at the grassroots. Um, can you tell us you know, what this does look like at the grassroots from your perspective working on the child labor issues? And also what you have found is most successful strategies to actually register, register progress, so that, and which is something you've, you've done. I mean, one of the things I admired most about you is you're not just jumping up and down calling attention to the problem, but you're actually registering progress. Yeah, so Nick, you are asking me to give the full speech of the, <laughs> the problems and solutions. Anyway, so, um, let me underline one thing here is that slavery is not only the total denial of human rights and human dignity, it's an assault on humanity. Mm. Humanity is on stake if we continue slavery. These numbers are important. For me, every number has a breathing heart, eyes, face, name. I was with a group of children in a remote village uh, in Ivory Coast. These children were producing uh, cocoa beans, the ingredient of chocolate. Out of curiosity, I asked to the boys and girls, how do you like chocolate? They looked at each other. What chocolate is? Mm. I said, chocolate is a tasty, delicious, sweet thing. They said, we never taste it. We have never heard. We have never touched chocolate. The whole world is using chocolate. But these children who are producing at wealth at the cost of their childhood and freedom, <coughs> they had no idea. I was sitting with a group of young girls in Pakistan who, was, who were stitching football some years ago. I Just saw translation, soccer balls. Soccer balls, yeah, 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 yeah. I think that all of them are not uh, Americans. Some of them should be <laughs> Europeans and Indians. Uh, yeah, so um, I saw that the youngest one, six, seven year old, maybe eight maximum, she was sucking blood when she uh, made some mistake and the needles entered into her, uh, her fingers. And I asked, uh, now I'm here, I will make sure that you would be freed from here and I will ensure your education through my friends in Pakistan. What is your aspiration for the future? What is your dream? She looked here and there and asked, what dream is? Mm. What dream is? Mm. I tried to explain. Then she said, if I am given a chance, I would like to hit with a real football on the ground. This is slavery. I freed a group of children very recently. People thought that after my Nobel Peace Prize, I'm not going to uh, conduct the rescue operation or undercover operation. I still do sometimes because it gives me energy. So right in Delhi, when I rescued the group of children, I found that many of them could not walk properly and could not see the sunlight. Mm. For three years, they were confined. They were all trafficked victims. They were all enslaved, child laborers, eight, nine, 10 year old, and forced to work in a jeans factory, which is for a foreign company, uh, in an underground factory. They could not see the sunlight. The darkness in their life is slavery. Mm. The denial of beams is slavery. No test of things they produce is slavery. This is the human face of slavery, which is so disgusting. And when I come here, I tell you that I feel ashamed and sometimes I feel angry. I'm angry. Mm. 
Because I refuse to accept that the world with so much power, you have power. I was rubbing shoulders with a number of prime ministers and presidents and who not. The big, big, big bo uh, business leaders, tycoons of business. And if all of us cannot wipe out the dark plot, the dark blot on the face of humankind, who else will do? I refuse to accept that we don't do it. We can't do it. We can do it. What we need is compassion. So can, can I ask about how, so how we channel that anger? Because I guess one of the things that I worry about is that you know, people will hear the story and they'll think, oh, I never want to touch chocolate again, which isn't going to help those kids. Or you mentioned the soccer ball, the footballs um, yep. in, uh, in Pakistan, in Sialkot. And I, I mean, that, that there was an agreement, a famous agreement in, in uh, Pakistan to help deal with the issue of child labor in, the, in those soccer balls. And it helped in some respects, but I also have misgivings about the effect of that agreement and that conservative families who didn't want the wives to leave the home ended up then not participating and becoming more impoverished and their kids less likely to access school. And it, it's, I mean, it certainly helped in many ways, but, I, but it reminds me that that it's very, it's much more than good intentions. And I think there's sometimes a risk that, especially outsiders march in with good intentions and say, okay, here's what we're gonna do without a lot of listening. So how, how do we actually I, register that progress? I, I see the positive aspect. Of course, we have the mixed results in Pakistan and Bangladesh and in many parts of the world. But when we rescue a child from child labor or slavery, we are creating a new job for an adult, and that adult could be the very mother or father of that child. Globally speaking, we have 152 million children are in full-time jobs, and 210 million adults jobless. And in most cases, these children, child laborers and child slaves are none but the very children of those jobless adults. So we have to see it. In Pakistan, I have seen that many of the children were pushed back to different industries like uh, this uh, surgical instrument manufacturers and so on. I have been working in Pakistan for many years, so I, I, I know. But until a large extent, children were able to access education. They have been able to go to education. So I, let me also complete one, the, your first question. One is that we need laws, strong laws, which we lack in many countries. Laws have to be enforced with utmost political will and urgency. Like in this figure, if we look at into the data, 600,000 to 800,000 uh, victims of uh, trafficking. According to GTIP report, less than 15,000 prosecutions were made. Less than 9,000 or almost 9,000 convictions were made. Only 60,000, uh, 66,000 trafficking victims were identified according to the latest report of GTIP. So it means we are failing in enforcement of laws. So legal deterrent is one thing. The second thing is an education. If we are able to ensure good quality, free, child-friendly education for all children in their primary and secondary classes, I'm quite confident that we will be able to find preventive solutions to slavery and child labor. That requires, that is not a big deal. We need only 40 billion additional dollars annually to ensure education for all children in the world. And what is this 40 billion dollars? It is less than a weak <laughs> global military expenditure. <laughs> Who is our priority? Teachers are priority or soldiers priority? Mm -hmm. Bullets and guns are our priority or the books and pencils are our priority? We have to set it here. Why we are coming in Davos? We have to put a very strong message to the world leaders and everyone here that our children, their schools, their teachers, their books, their pencils are our priority. We have to go with that kind of anger. We have to convert that anger into positive action, constructive action. I would also call upon at this stage, if you like me to, that there is a serious need of setting up an agency under United Nations which deals with, which, which is empowered to act, to act extraterritorial and cross-border jurisdiction. That should deal with child slavery, human slavery, trafficking, 
sex offenses, cyber crimes, uh, like Interpol, but also more than Interpol, it should have a tribunal power that can also help in, uh, in uh, putting fines uh, against the companies or traffickers and so on, but also uh, help in rehabilitation of trafficking and slavery victims. So that agency is needed, otherwise we will keep on having the, this, this blot on humanity. And that is also needed that the various agencies dealing with trafficking, refugee crisis, migration, labor, etc., they should coordinate. We are talking of fragmented world today. But sometimes I see the United Nations agencies are also very compartmentalized and fragmented. Why not IOM, uh, UNCRC, ILO, UNODC come together? Because the issues of trafficking, migration, uh, refugee crisis are so intermingled because one is jumping into another domain. It is so intermingled. So we have to go for that. And finally, I would say that there is a serious need of global registry of traffickers, sex offenders, and the companies who are using child labor in their supply chain for naming and shaming. Yeah. Um, on your point about uh, global military expenditures versus the needs for education, I um, hope that a certain leader who will be speaking here might in his preparation um, see your comments and uh, be influenced by them. <laughs> um, Arnie, one of the part of the, the answer to this problem is indeed the business community uh, stepping up. And in, to some extent it has. There's still a lot more work to be done. This is an area where uh, you and Marriott have been a leader. Can you talk about what the hotel industry needs to do what, you know, and, and what kind of progress there has been? Yeah, thank you. Um, and good to be with you all this morning. Let me start by uh, thanking my fellow panelists. I'm, I'm humbled by your work. Uh, it, it is, it's extraordinary service, and I'm sure many in the, in the room are very much engaged in the same process. Uh, it is a um, heart-wrenching set of stories uh, that we're confronted with, and uh, the, the um, commitment you've made to uh, dealing with those, preventing those stories, I guess, making them heartwarming stories instead. Uh, is really commendable and, and um, impressive. Um, one other sort of uh, preparatory comment. Uh, I think as we think about our business, there are two kinds of stories we want to be told over and over again. Uh, we want one story to be about the extraordinary um, special aspects of travel. Uh, it's a time where we go someplace, hopefully gather a great memory, uh, take it home from wherever we come from, uh, meet people, create bonds across cultures, uh, uh, learn new places, all of those sorts of things. That's sort of the aspiration of what uh, certainly Marriott, but I think many in the travel and tourism industry are, are directed against. I think the second set of stories, which is um, really important and part of our legacy at Marriott, is the story of human opportunity and human integrity. Uh, we have about 700,000 people who wear our name badge every day. In many of those markets, the jobs are transformative. Virtually every hotel you can go, certainly in a city, looks like the United Nations. Uh, it, even in the United States, many of the big hotels in, uh, in big cities will have 50 nationalities represented. Uh, and they are a collection of stories of people who are migrating and moving to pursue opportunities. Uh, and if we can be engaged in that, that's an ex absolutely extraordinary thing. Human trafficking, on the other hand, is a blight against those two uh, aspirations. Again, the glory of travel and the uh, human potential and human opportunity. Uh, and you know, we, we recognize we're, we're not a police force. Our, our fundamental job is not to uh, cross-examine everybody when they're checking into a hotel, but instead to welcome people to our hotels uh, and we are seeing people from all over the world, and we're seeing uh, multi-generational uh, groups check in. Uh, we're seeing men and women check in. So, you know, we have to make sure we find a way to be welcoming, but also to do everything we can to identify the bad stories that might be taking place. And so what we've done is really focus on training in the first instance. We've trained 225,000 people last year in hu human trafficking. 
Uh, that is not 100% yet, but we're going to get to 100%. And of course, we've started with the markets where the risk we think is the highest. Uh, and uh, training is different if you're a housekeeper or you're in the front desk or you're someplace else in the hotel. But we want our associates not to be police, but to have their eyes open uh, and to be able to say, what am I seeing here uh, in this guest room or with this party that is checking in? So yeah. how, how does that work in practice? Because that's kind of sort of awkward for a hotel. If it, I mean, there's a middle-aged man who checks in with a young girl. Do they call the police? The, do they ask? What, what, the, the, what do they do? the training in the first instance is going to cause them to think about the possibility that there's human trafficking. Uh, and human judgment is a powerful thing. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that we can say from a headquarters environment, for example, look for precisely X, Y, or Z when somebody's checking in. But if we say, mm -hmm. beware that, that there may be human trafficking occurring, and be aware of the dynamic between the people that you see. Uh, we've had two stories last year. We had a 13-year-old boy uh, that was uh, observed with adults, uh, and the team basically said, this does not appear right to us. Uh, and police were called in, and in fact, it was a case of human trafficking. Uh, another instance with a, with a girl, and these are very sort of concrete stories, and they're not, they're not dealing with uh, six or 800,000, they're dealing with one story at a time. Uh, but if we can have the team really thinking about, okay, what am I observing and what am I seeing, uh, and then raise it to their supervisors and, and uh, watch it maybe a little bit more closely. Uh, but if there's a doubt, then uh, reach out to the experts and the authorities. Cool. Sharon, you've registered a, a real success uh, lately with Qatar. Can you talk about that? Sure. And to what degree it could be a model for other countries? Certainly. And what I can say is that Kailash is absolutely right. When you sit with, walk amongst the slave labour camps, when you see uh, domestic workers who've been rescued, you cannot understand why there is so much cruelty from one human being to another. And so we also have a job to do in terms of talking about what our humanity really means, what's our shared humanity. But on Qatar in particular, when I took over this role that I now have in, in the end of 2010, like any good business should, and uh, of course we're a trade union, but we did uh, due diligence on the world. I wanted to understand the world of labour. I came from Australia, I'd run the Australian labour movement. And where were the risks for, you know, safe work, decent work, etc.? And when I looked at the Gulf states in particular, we already had the data on traditional impact of slavery and that was an issue. Kailash, uh, you know, does uh, much more than uh, anybody, but there's a lot of people who've supported his work and others in the, uh, in the child labour field. You but have we, always been the one. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we have not, we had not looked at what this risk was. All of the Gulf states had adopted this model called kafala. It's a system of modern slavery. In fact, when we first said modern slavery, people kept saying, but they're not in chains. I would say, come with me. If you are owned effectively by one other human being, so you sign a contract, you then go to places like Qatar, the contract is torn up, you are forced to pay legal fees for the, for the sake of getting a job because we've failed the development model totally with a model of globalisation that's not delivered jobs everywhere. No one wants to leave their country to go into uh, to slavery. And then you find your contracts torn up. You're liable to actually earn uh, uh, half of what was promised. You are uh, basically quartered in uh, you know, deplorable conditions. If you walk those labour camps, which they're now cleaning up in Qatar, but you know, they're just deplorable conditions. And anybody you take there, journalists, senior officials, anyone would just say nobody would want to live here. And then, of course, you didn't have a court system that was just, could take two years, all sorts of languages, you had to file papers in Arabic. I mean, the whole thing was set up. No minimum wage, even. It was depending on the country. So if you're a poor country, like Nepal, you would get paid less than somebody from India or, or other places. 
So I just said this is appalling. Not only is it a risk to a model of decent work, but we can't. If we aren't standing against slavery, who is? If the workers of the world aren't standing up for their brothers and sisters, who is? So, of course, I did become probably the uh, Qatari's worst nightmare. And, I mean, we're, we're campaigners, so we're opportunists. And uh, when they... Uh, I looked at all these countries and I went, when you campaign, you have to have leverage. It can be name and shame. It can be uh, law. I wish the rule of law is often easier. But somebody called FIFA, which in the process we've managed to help clean up with others as well, or it's on the way, um, awarded the World Cup to Qatar. And we said, that's it. This will bring the world's attention. So five years, a bit more than five years actually. And we didn't do anything for two years. We walked, because I'm a teacher by trade. I wanted to be able to give first, you know, prime witness accounts. So our team walked the camps. Gemma, who's here with me, more often than not, uh, you know, I'd say we're going back, you know, and she'd say, okay. And, uh, and we documented workers' stories. And they're friends now. Ben, a guy who uh, we helped uh, rescue. In fact, we uh, threatened the government that uh, we would take the television cameras if they didn't give back his passport. This wasn't an employer, by the way. It was the state. And that we'd pay the fines. He's now in a good job. And, but, you know, what we've done with Qatar, finally, and the blockade helped. But, you know, and the Qatari government, I think, are genuine when they say being freed of the GCC allowed them to go further, allowed them to explore whether there was a settlement. So what have we done? Two million migrant workers within, by the end of, of April, there will be no exit visa. You will no longer be trapped in Qatar if you're a migrant worker. If you, you will, in fact, uh, have a new compliance system and it'll be monitored by the opening of an ILO office in the country because we use the ILO to get a three-year agreement. There will be a process where a minimum wage will be determined for every worker. So the apartheid system of wages gone on the basis of evidence and already they've sealed the floor. It's not enough, but they've put a floor with accommodation costs and no one can pay less than that. And, uh, and there will be workplace representation. Not quite full freedom of association yet, but there are agreements with our global unions with companies as well. So we're tacking that from, uh, from two ends. But it will mean a system of dignity, of decent work, mm -hmm. of human rights. And while not quite at the 87, the freedom mm -hmm. of association point, in fact, we organise. We've organised for six years underground, you can go to union meetings in Qatar, their communities, and we will build those workplace representation. It's a huge <coughs> task. But along the way, a couple of things have happened. Because when you're a trade union, you make trouble, that's our job if something's unjust. But once you sign an agreement, you're a partner on the team. So now we're assisting with the ILO, implement those agreements, and, uh, and that's a model that we now want Saudi and the UAE to follow because they're our next targets. You know, you cannot give up on this stuff. The other thing that I, you know, I'm thinking of a woman called, called Aisha, who very brave expats and a couple of migrant workers rescued from a domestic uh, servitude environment, beaten, tortured, burnt, raped, and uh, almost at, at death point. And you look at that and it's, it's Kyle Ash's point, why? Why would that happen? Well, you know, one of the expats who helped rescue Aisha actually got charged herself. She's a senior human manager, mm. resources manager, she was okay. She got charged, not the victim. So we're moving past that. And I'm proud to now be a partner with Qatar. We've done some other things. We've set up a mega sports centre, a sports rights centre with FIFA, with the IOC, the ILO, the UN uh, Human Rights uh, Office of the Human Rights Commissioner and indeed key sponsors from the business world, ourselves and the sports representatives as well as the construction unions. And that sports rights centre will work to see that never again will in fact mega sports be awarded to a country where they don't actually have law and practice around human and labour rights. So some good things have come out of this at the architectural level, but now we'll implement this, but we're putting every country on notice. The final thing I'd say is it's not enough to just end the kafala system. We have to make sure that governments live up 
to their responsibility because the, the ILO protocol on, uh, on forced labour is actually you know, a responsibility of governments to ratify it, to put it into their law, and indeed business to do their due diligence. And I'm delighted to sit here with a business leader who is actively taking responsibility himself. No one's actually convinced him he had to, hmm. but, uh, but that's responsibility. It will take all of us. And the due diligence required by UN uh, guiding uh, principles for business and human rights says you must examine when you've got supply chains, uh, uh, slavery in your supply chains, must have grievance procedures and must be able to affect remedy. Now, if we did these things together, I'm with uh, Kailash and Keith and you, we, we can clean this up. Nobody should be allowed to have the capacity to enslave another human being. Here, here. Um, you know, on your, your point uh, about how is it that people do these things to other human beings, um, I was, um, you know, it seems to me that it's some combination of complete impunity and potential for profit, that it's in people's self-interest. And in particular, I spent a lot of time over the years uh, getting to know and interviewing a brothel owner in Cambodia who had a, um, her business model was kidnapping rural girls and um, selling their virginity and then locking them up in their brothel. And uh, it, from her point of view as a businesswoman, this was just how she could best use this building that she had and make the most money. And then part, because of attention from NGOs, from uh, journalists, from outsiders, there began to be more pressure. Uh, and so the police didn't close her brothel, but they began to demand more in bribes to keep it open. And so sh now she was paying about $5 a day in bribes. And this disrupted her business model. And so <laughs> she, ended up figuring that she could actually make more money as a grocery store. And so she closed the brothel and opened a grocery store. And it was um, sort of a reminder that, you know, people, they are following their incentives and one can change those incentives uh, by some combination of ending impunity and reducing their ability to monetize other people. And How about tearing up the culture of silence? I mean, it's the same with violence against women. It's the same with, you know, uh, you know whether you uh, put, you know, child, children into servitude or, you know, train them as child labourers or even while on the edge of enslavement, you know, even in Cambodia, that traditional model of women selling beer for our major companies with their bodies wearing the uniform of the beer company. Now we have contracts with them. It's not quite as bad, but still not terrific. So, you know, we have to say, what is good, what is acceptable business models? And frankly, if we aren't prepared to speak out together, because I don't believe that decent businesses want this on their reputational risk, but as human beings, they don't want it. It's the same with the, the supply chain depravity. We have to end extortion, speak out about it, because otherwise, the, not just the... Uh, low-paid, low unsafe, insecure work that's in our supply chains now, for which no business takes responsibility, then we've also got to acknowledge that slavery and informal work, predominantly the face of women except in the fishing industry, is actually appearing in our supply chains. So what's the model of acceptable business is the question, and let's tear up the culture of silence. Bill, let me ask you about that, that culture of silence, and, you know, because I think Sharon's absolutely right that that's what allows this to fester. And it's, you know, on the one hand, I'm delighted that we're all having this panel here, but it is kind of striking that at a World Economic Forum at which 21% of the representatives are women, this room is about 80% women. And indeed, discussions of this issue do often tend to be conversations, you know, people preaching to the choir, talking to people who already agree. And I think it's, the challenge becomes how mm. we expand the choir, how we mm. break that culture of silence more broadly. And so, Bill, you've been thinking about this, you've been wrestling with this around the world. How do we get traction on building more of a global consciousness? 
One of the most immediate things we can do is to bring in the media more. I cannot recall in my long experience an incident in which one story brought us all together around this issue as well as the CNN story on the, on the slave trade in Libya. Yeah. Now, we've been working in Libya for, since 2006, and mm -hmm. I have 200 people on the ground. We've been working in these detention centers trying to improve, trying to convince the, the government of President Siraj that let's at least separate the men and the women, put the women at least in an open uh, a reception center and then use that as a model, get rid of detention centers altogether. Well, all of a sudden, um, and we, eva we had already evacuated 13,000 people from the detention center last year when the story broke. And then it brought, it brought the African Union, the European Union, the Siraj government, IOM, UNHCR, uh, and everybody together saying, this is horrible. Let's do something about it. So I got a mandate on the 28th of November to increase even more, and we, we took another 8,000 out before the end of the year, we'll take another 10,000 out before the end of February, and we're gonna empty those detention centers, but, but the story was great because it really broke things loose, but if we cannot break the smuggler's business model, yeah. they'll simply refill yeah. them again, because yeah. it's all about making so money. Yeah. And if you can get 5,000 ahead, uh, even 2,000 to cross the Mediterranean on a, on a, a boat that's not gonna get you there, and then if you see people come, you just push them overboard. Life, life means nothing to these smugglers. And we've set up, we've set up way stations along, all the way from Senegal to Cameroon, the biggest one being in Agadez, Niger, where we've, we do three things. One, we warn them about smugglers. Two, we, if there's one, we think there's a refugee, we turn them over to UNHCR. And those who are weary from the journey or think, oh, I made a mistake setting out, we take them home with money and dignity to get life started again. And it's not about pushing them back, it's about saving life. And, and that's the main thing, because otherwise they're gonna become slaves. Irregular migrants are one of the greatest sources of slavery. They're totally vulnerable. They have no papers. They, they can't go home again. They've used all their family's money to get as far as they got. So we're gonna to continue to do this until we can empty those. And we're getting great cooperation from everyone, AU, EU, Libyan government, et cetera. I'll be back there in a couple of weeks again, to see how we're doing. We're this, just about out of time, but uh, I, 30 I, seconds, please. Yeah, so this is very important. Challenging and breaking the culture of silence. And that requires a mass movement. Uh, we organized the Long March, Global March Against Child Labor back in 1998 for the first time to challenge child labor, child trafficking, uh, and uh, uh, ITUC was the integral part and co-founder of the, the global movement. We went across 103 countries, covered 80,000 kilometers distance, 15 million people joined the march, and finally we succeeded collectively in the new international law, ILO Convention on the Worst Forms of Child Labor, that includes slavery, trafficking, et cetera. Mass mobilization has helped in changing mindset also and created a culture of coalitions. Recently in India, we organized a rather challenging uh, mass movement, and that is uh, the Bharat Yatra or India March against child sexual abuse combined with trafficking against trafficking. For the first time of this kind anywhere in the world to challenge the social taboo and the old age mindset of fear and silence. And it was participated by 1.2 million people <laughs> in India alone and it was massive effect. Uh, so children started, started speaking and that has helped in immediate policy changes by several governments. And finally, in a second, I'll tell you that we have launched a campaign called 100 million for 100 million. Because we have already mobilized 30 million, 20 million, 40 million. Now, using technology and other things, 100 million young people are victims of violence, slavery, trafficking, child labor, denial of education, refugee crisis. On the other hand, hundreds of millions of young people are ready to do something good for the society. They have element of idealism beside enthusiasm and and, and energy. So why not these two diversely, not just parallel, diversely going constituencies of youth should be brought closer because if they go in like that, the haps nots and haps and the well of children in school, college, universities, students, they want to do something. So 100 million for 100 million campaign is aiming at 
at least 100 million well of young people to become the voices, spokesperson, champions, and change makers for 100 million left out brothers and sisters of them. And that I call globalization of compassion. Mm. Mm. We have globalized everything, now we have to globalize compassion. Here, here. Yeah. Bravo. <laughs> Well, we're just about out of time. Let me just briefly recap some of the points uh, made. I mean, one of the, uh, I think one of the key points is that we, although we clearly need laws to address this issue, it has to go way beyond that. Uh, Kailash talked about education. You know, if you think about ways to inoculate a population to reduce the risk, then education is something that is cheap. We know how to do it. Uh, for 17 cents a day, you can offer a school feeding program, uh, per 17 cents per child uh, per day, that is going to get more kids to go to school, uh, make them less vulnerable later on. Uh, and an education you know, is still something that is dramatically underfunded. The Global Partnership for Education is missing $2, two billion dollars a year uh, uh, from commitments on that. We also need, and it's maybe so pertinent to say that here at Davos, the business community to become more engaged. Arnie is a model here of what the business community can do. We need that coming not just from the C-suite, but translated down to actions at the grassroots, because that vigilance is so critical there. And we need that kind of pressure on the cutters of the world. And you know, brava, and may you go after next, indeed, as you say, UAE and Saudi Arabia um, to try to interrupt these and to remind us all that, you know, your point about how there may not be a visible chain there. It may not be somebody who is actually, you know, our mind sometimes says, oh, slavery, somebody is chained to a radiator somewhere. That's not what typically slavery looks like in 2018. It's more subtle than that. But to, we need to, I think, make that point. And, and you know, is the, the point that Bill made about interrupting the business models, uh, which we have had some success doing, which we can do, but that is gonna happen only if we can break this culture of silence and spread this beyond the choir and reach a broader audience. That's partly what this panel has done here. Please join me in giving them a big hand. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank lovely. You. Thank you.